Cable Channel 6 would like to invite you to the round table. Welcome to another edition of the uh, Roundtable. My name is Paul Dingham, and I host these programs, which appear periodically here on uh, Marine City and St. Clair's Cable Channel 6s, and also now throughout northern Macomb and all of St. Clair County on uh, Channel 12 and Channel 916. As always, we have a very interesting guest, a person who's involved in lots of things throughout our area. That's no different today, returning by popular demand, yeah. uh, the state senator of the 25th district, Mr. Philip Pavlo. Nice to see you. Great to be back. We uh, oh, I, we haven't seen you and probably be since before Christmas. Been too and, busy working. And that's good. <laughs> the taxpayers like that thing. Yeah, so. they made an investment and we're making a return on that for them. Since that time uh, to today in, mm -hmm. in the uh, middle part of April, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of things going on in the legislature, in the right. state of Michigan. You've been... Uh, High, uh, front and center with most of the action. Yeah. Uh, so, well, that's where do we start? Well, I mean, going back to 2011 when Governor <laughs> Snyder came in and I moved from the House to the Senate, um, we have been on a very aggressive reform agenda and we've made significant changes to the way state government operates today and all for the good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had to make some very difficult decisions and we've had to kind of spread some sacrifice to all the taxpayers of the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. But just, let's fast forward. A year ago, we were you know, working on a budget that required removing about a billion eight worth of oh, deficit spending. What a number. Move um, fast forward to today, we're gonna be pushing budgets out of the Senate beginning um, next week. Um, and we've got almost a half a billion dollar surplus. So we've been able to turn that ship around in a very short amount of time. We've had to get serious about our spending. Yep. Bottom line is, is that we've put Michigan on a path now to succeed going forward. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of our long-term debt. We've got our year-to-year -year spending under control. It's been difficult, but we're much better today than we were a year ago. Uh, automotive industry, some of those people are doing a lot of hiring at this point. Yeah, we're starting to see an uptick in the jobs, people actually going back to work. We've had a corresponding reduction in the unemployment rate. Um, but we still have a long way to go. We're still struggling with really high unemployment in the state of Michigan. But the trend lines are positive, and I mean, the construction season is upon us. We have a lot of good things happening. People are going back to work in Michigan. Uh, you and the legislature were involved uh, with uh, help, trying to help Detroit. Right. It's a huge, huge problem. Part of this billion dollars you're talking about, yeah. but um, it looks like they've at least made the first step. Well, one of the things that we did right from the beginning in 2011 is we strengthened the emergency manager law in the state of Michigan, and it's been met with a lot of resistance. Yeah, I was I just going to say, a lot of people don't like it. Yeah, well, it was part of the actual recall effort that mm -hmm. uh, was out on me and mm -hmm. 18 other state senators, but here's what we've been able to do. Um, just by virtue of having that emergency manager law on the books and strengthened to a point where, you know, we're going to make the, the cities and municipalities responsible for that spending, we've got what we call a consent agreement signed with the state of Michigan and the city council and the mayor of Detroit, which is finally saying, look, we need to get serious about your spending there. You've got, um, you've run that city so close to the edge of bankruptcy. A bankruptcy for the city of Detroit means disaster for all the taxpayers in Michigan. There's collateral damage that will go everywhere. So having strong laws, um, you know, to, to require the financial responsibility to be carried out is important. We've come up short of having to have an emergency manager in mm -hmm. Detroit. We've got a consent agreement, which was voted on and approved by the city council. They maintain governance of the city, but there's some strict re, uh, restriction and restructuring that's going to be required um, of the city of Detroit to get them on a path to solvency again. One analysis I heard was that uh, it, 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 the problem took 30 or 40 years to build. Sure. And they just sort of let things keep going on and going on, and nobody actually ever slammed the door down and said, 
hold it. We got to take a close look at that. And I guess that's what you guys did. Right. And what's happened in Detroit, and it's happened in municipalities across the state, it's the long-term legacy costs Correct. Um, that are inherent in all government. Right. Um, you can control the year-to-year -year spending, but when you're doing that, you're also swiping the credit card on the long-term liabilities. And at some point, that will come back and start pulling your community or your school district down. So you really got to be serious about addressing that. And that requires, um, you know, changes to pension, changes to health care, the things that people don't like to deal with. But the end result is communities get pushed to bankruptcy if you don't. You, you alluded to the fact that there had been a recall campaign for you and for, for uh, some other uh, representatives and right. senators. Um, and a lot of that was pushed by uh, some of the unions that were sure. totally against you. Right. Uh, but but yet you still have the issues of how you're gonna how you're gonna restructure it. I and mean, you're in the education committee. Right. How does it all? How does it? How do we get an answer? If well, you, you, you get an answers. answer. You got to be bold and you got to be strong okay. in your convictions. And we had an old Michigan um, that I really don't want to be a part of anymore. I mean, okay. this this idea of rampant, you know, one two billion dollar deficits without addressing why we're having those continual deficits. Um, you know, particularly as it relates to education, we have a responsibility to educate every student in the state of Michigan. And with our economy the way that it is, we don't have the resources at our fingertips that we wish we do or we had in the past. Right. It's a new Michigan and the people that have been fighting, you know, probably the hardest against these reforms are the people that want and have an investment in the old way of doing business in Michigan and nobody um, in the legislature or the governor's office was campaigning a couple of years ago to maintain the status quo in Michigan. Right. There's a new direction, and, and we moved down that. It's been painful really, for some. Really, in either party. In either party. I mean, getting rid of the Michigan business tax was not a Republican or a Democrat idea. Right. These were ideas and, and, and recognition that the system we had is failing. Um, unfortunately, there are people that are tied to the old system um, that had a financial benefit or a career benefit that it doesn't exist anymore, but the people of Michigan demand better. Uh, in your uh, recent newsletter, you talked about the top 25 reforms of 2011. Can you share a few of those? Getting rid of mentioned? the Michigan business right. tax is, is absolutely key. We've reformed our unemployment system. We've informed, or reformed our um, workers' compensation. All the things that have made it difficult to do business in Michigan, we're beginning to knock those out. Um, the DEQ. Mm -hmm. which, you know, in many ways has been the enemy of business and agriculture in the state of Michigan for years. You know, we introduced 330 um, rules to be eliminated. Things like that, giving the agriculture community... A little house cleaning. A little house cleaning. And over, year, over the years, um, government has gotten so big and so intrusive, it's really stifled our economic growth. But, I mean, you even go further and you take a look at the way we're, you know, requiring... Um, employees on the public side to start contributing to their health care, um, contributing to their pension, just like everybody else in the private sector has been doing literally for decades in this state. We're bringing that same fiscal responsibility to state employees. And yes, it's been difficult, but I mean, the reality is we don't have the resources that we used to have. Michigan used to be a rich state. We're not today, and if we don't react to it, we'll be even poorer. Are we moving up in the rankings? Or is oh, we it, are. Is it too early for us no, to it's, see it's, some, some? it's not too early. I mean, last year's budget that we erased the deficit, um, built a actual surplus, moved the state of Michigan up in the bond ratings as okay. a state. You know, right. The Finch Group mm -hmm. increased our ratings uh, at a time when the national credit rating was going down. That was the first indication that we were on the right path. The fact that we're dealing with budget surpluses today is an indication that we've got our spending under control and we're being reasonable with it. And when, when the state's bond rating improves, it improves for every school district and every city and municipality and village that has borrowed money. And in many cases, they have bonding for sewer projects. Well, it allows them to go back to the market and refinance at a lower rate because the stability is back in state government. You touched on surpluses. Yeah. Um, some people were crying, let's spend the surplus here, let's spend it there, let's do this. That right. Has the legislature come up with an answer to what they're going to do with the surplus, yeah. paying off the debt? Well, we've been paying off the debt. Okay. And at the same time that we've been struggling you know, for the last decade, we've been tacking 
dollars onto our state credit card. So we need to address that. And that's one of the things that, that pulls you out of the slump. And it gets you the recognition of the Wall Street banking community that says, you guys are being responsible with your budgeting. Um, I think one of the clearest indications that we've seen um, was in our in our tax environment in the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. We were 49th in the country in terms of um, the worst, unfortunately, business tax in the state in the country, and we've moved to number seven by okay, instituting okay, there you go. a corporate income tax. That's a good movement. Um, when we go back uh, into session again tomorrow, we're going to begin debating the personal property tax, and that's really what we call the tool tax. Mm -hmm. Every business and organization in the state is penalized to a certain extent for expanding. So if you're gonna buy a new delivery truck, if you're gonna buy a new automatic screw machine or office furniture or computer systems, we in Michigan have what they call a personal property tax where we're gonna start taxing those assets. We're moving to transition over time away from that penalizing tax as well. I think that that moves us from seven, obviously into a top five. Um, tax policy isn't the only thing that you know job providers look to but it certainly is an indicator of stability. Um, a lot of uh, what's, what's coming up uh, in the spring for the, for the legislature? You said you're working on the budget. Working on the budget, we wanna didn't have we, that. Didn't we go through a two year budget last year? Yep. If that's the case, why are you working on it this year? Well, constitutionally, you can't pass a two year budget, but you can use it for a planning tool. Okay. And what we've been able to do is we set the pattern and we set the expectations um, a year ago. So what we're doing now is taking into consideration, obviously today is tax day, right? and so, the state of Michigan will see it's probably it's, it's high watermark in terms of revenue because of the April 15th deadline. Then we'll take a look at that data and we'll see, does it meet our projections of where we thought we were gonna be at this time? And then if it is, then we calculate those, those dollars and then we make our final appropriations. And again, I think we're on schedule to have a past budget uh, balanced with a surplus by the end of May. And I've sat at this round table with you many times before into the month of October when we oh, didn't right. have a budget. And we've had government shut down two years out of the last four. Um, what we're doing by having a May budget approved is number one, sending a signal to our education community who runs on a you know school year that begins on July 1st. We've told them, here's your expectations, here's what money, there's no guessing anymore. So they can go then and build their budgets and get their local boards and city councils to approve it because we were ahead of the game. Um, you, 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 will, now will that budget, will you sit on this budget and project it again for two years? Yes, we will. So you'll, you're gonna get the It's two, a rolling two, two year, year schedule. Yeah, so we're always two years out. I mean, based on the best predictions right. that we can, but right. constitutionally our spending has to be approved year to year. And I really like the trends and I think that um, the people of the state of Michigan have some certainty now. Um, it's probably not as much money in the budget that everybody would like because there's really an infinite demand on that, but we're living within our means and that's a departure from where we've been. Well, you alluded to the fact that the automotive industries and some of those people already had their cuts over the years and, and they learned how to sacrifice and, and, and downsize, et cetera, right. et cetera. So now the, the rest of the, the public uh, entities are trying to do their really have to do the same. Well, they have to, and there's always that resistance because, well, I mean, great resistance. It, it, people it, didn't like it. They don't, no, they don't. And, and, but here's the reality. If you take a look at the people that are in the private sector, mm -hmm. if you have a job today in Michigan, you're probably doing one or two jobs that you didn't mm -hmm. do before mm -hmm. while you were in that capacity. Mm -hmm. So everybody's doing more. And I mean, it's just not feasible to take that same model and apply it to state and local government and education to say, look, the rest of the world is on a completely different path. We need to react or we're going to you know, be in further problems. Uh, one of the things that was in the paper the other day was the, the helmet law. That was a volatile uh, thing for you too. And you were the guy that uh, introduced it. You sponsored the bill. Yeah. Uh, so it finally, after 15, 20 years? Yeah, it's, been a, it's been a conversation in Lansing about for at least two decades. And the question has been, should a motorcycle rider have the freedom to choose to wear a helmet or right. not? And it's passed through the legislature a couple times and only to meet the veto of Governor Granholm. And you know, we said we need to take another run at this because there's an economic advantage to 
being a helmet free state if you choose to do so. Okay. All of the other Great Lakes states have the option of wearing oh, a helmet do. or not. Okay. And motorcycle tourism is a big industry. And as we're promoting Michigan through the Pure Michigan ads around the country, um, we're not getting that subsection of tourism. I think the other thing too is that there are, after hearing, you know, being a part of the transportation committee where this bill has been vetted for the last five years, there are motorcycle riders out there who believe that they are safer without a helmet. Hmm. They have more situational awareness. Their sight lines are better. They can hear more. They don't have the fatigue of the additional weight of the no, helmet moving do, them around. Turn down the radio, they'll yeah, hear more. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, th this whole conversation about will insurance rates go up, the insurance industry wasn't able to demonstrate Emergency how Emergency rooms high. will be more full. That's well, another complaint. What you have to look at is that motorcycle riding is inherently uh, mm -hmm. dangerous activity. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the fatalities that occur and in the injuries are lower body in injuries. Okay. I mean, you have an enormous amount of blood that goes through the bottom half of your mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. And typically, that's where the point of impact is. When a motorcycle is you know, run off the road, they typically go over the helmet or over the handlebars. And so we just basically said, and, it, and the bill had overwhelming support, you know, bipartisan support, 24 votes in the Senate, 60 some votes in the House. And you know, the governor didn't indicate whether he was going to sign it or not. I didn't want he him to. It. I didn't want my first veto coming from him. But you know, he signed it, and you know, we're on to other things now. You and I would sit here years ago, and I'm thinking five, six, seven years ago, and we, I would say to you, what a great opportunity to be in Lansing. Yeah. That, that, you know, you can really do things. You can, and, and nothing got done, not because necessarily because of you, but because of the whole apparatus and the whole place it seems to be moving whether some people like it or right. don't like it at least we've seen some action well politics is a funny thing and it's it's oftentimes self-correcting you okay. know years yeah. ago when i was with you i was a republican we had a democrat um, governor in yeah. place the house and the senate were under different leaderships we flip-flopped republican control democrat control but we got to a point where the people of michigan made a they made a strong statement in 2010 and they felt that the group and the party most capable of a new direction for Michigan were Republicans. And fortunately, I'm a Republican. And so we have a House, a Senate, a Supreme Court, an Attorney General, Secretary of State, all um, you know, governed Same. by Republicans Same. today. Same. And has that been a great advantage for me and to move our agenda? It has, but I think that in the upcoming elections in 2012, as the House of Representatives is up, I think that you'll see that these policies will be rewarded and you'll maintain, hopefully, that Republican majority. If we flip back and forth, it's because the voters have made that decision. Mm -hmm. And it's not a coincidence that we're there. I'm happy to be there. I've been on both sides of it. But if we can really demonstrate that the policies that, that we've championed for the last couple of years are making an impact on Michigan's families, then we'll be voted back. If not, and we'll that, be out the door. And that is the right way to look at it. It's I mean. how, it, it's, it is a self-correcting system. It doesn't always go the way that we want it. Um, to be on the outside is not any fun. I've been on both, yes, I've been on both sides of it. Um, you know, we don't get cocky about it. We, you know, we, we still have a job to do. And, and if it's what the voters have asked you to do, um, then you'll be rewarded. Um, St. Clair County, uh, still uh, high unemployment, uh, yeah. still uh, the, the bridge is not done. They don't know what they're going to do there. Uh, yeah. Any news for us on St. Clair County? Well, I just came from a meeting with them, Dad, about an hour ago, and we're talking about some challenges that the businesses are facing with Water the construction, Street, yeah. with the Water Street. We had probably 20 business owners there, MDOT, the county officials, city, um, you know, Representative Gilbert, Representative Muxlow was there. Um, one thing that we do have in St. Clair County is we have great cooperation. Mm -hmm. And, you mm -hmm. know, coming out of that meeting, it looks like we landed on a solution. Not perfect, but it appears that MDOT is working in a very cooperative way with the stakeholders. And we have a solution that's going to ease some of the impact on the businesses. But I think when you look state, uh, countywide, we do still struggle. Our mm -hmm. economy is, is truly based in the automotive market. It's not, it, it's a little bit early to say, you know, we're out of the woods, but I think that we're on a path that 
will get us there. Good. Um, you know, jobs are coming back. The agriculture industry is, you know, in good shape. And we, we still have a long way to go, though. Well, down on uh, uh, Putty Gut Road, uh, there was a plant that sat idle for a while. And mm -hmm. now you drive by and it was purchased by, it was Continental Plastics. And now yeah. it's been purchased by, I think it's Magnum or yeah. somebody else. And now there's hundreds of cars around it. And right. there's two or three shifts. It's You can see that things are starting to, to and to, think, up a little and bit. to think just, you know, eight, ten years ago, oh. we took that activity for granted. Yes. I mean, look at the number of companies that employed, you know, between 100 and 250 employees oh, gone. Blue I mean, just plastics, go through St. Clair. Right. Pine River, 400 employees. Blue Water Plastics, 900. Right out of the city of St. Right. Clair. Gone. Right. And so when they start coming back, it's like, wow, this is kind there's of interesting. Jobs, yeah, 15. Jobs. And we're counting them in tens and dozens rather than hundreds as, as we looked at during the exodus, but I think the bottom line is is that we've reshaped how state government runs. Okay. We've got a new tax policy. We're lightening up and, and cleaning up some of the burdensome environmental and, and occupational regulations in there. And we're going to put our best foot forward. Again, every job that comes in the private sector is the result of somebody's confidence in Michigan to make a capital investment. And so we continue to take care of that side of it it's going to be up to that sector to bring those jobs. We can only make it attractive, you know, to a certain point. Senator Philip Pavlo, did we cover it all? Did we get it all? You got it all. You can get a lot in a half hour. That's good work. <laughs> we try. We try. That's it for this edition of the uh, Roundtable. Senator uh, Phil Pavlo, the 25th District, the State of Michigan, was our special guest. Until next time, I'm Paul Dingham. Thanks for watching.